the Bible in the 21st century. In this series of presentations, we're looking at the theme of end times. What does the Bible teach about end times? Or more specifically, what can we find in the New Testament about end times and the return of Jesus? Now when we look at what John shows us in Revelation, we're going to start by looking at chapter 20 in this presentation. It's going to take three presentations to cover the ground of looking at the book of Revelation from the context of end times. In this presentation we will look at the book of Revelation in an overall sense its nature and its purpose and meaning. And what we will see is that end times is not the major theme, although it has implications for end times that are important. However, in the next presentation, we're going to focus on the first part of chapter 20, <clears throat> which is very definitely related to end times, and brings in things that have led to ideas called millennialisms, related to a thousand years, which are controversial today, and we'll try to sort that out and come to a clearer picture of what it means. Then in the third of the three presentations, which is the ninth overall, we'll look at chapters 20 to 22, which picture God's goal for humanity. That clearly has strong importance when we come to think of the return of Jesus and end times. But we'll start by looking at the book of all. But before we do that, let's just look back at what we found when we looked at John in his letters. That seems to be a pattern that's obvious in the New Testament. Something happened in the spiritual realms as a result of the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. This is the way it was seen. Jesus had defeated Satan's ultimate power and he did it by suffering love shown in the cross and he was vindicated by the resurrection. Satan, the evil angel that opposes humanity and opposes God, his ultimate power had been reduced. His wings had been clipped. Jesus himself described it that way, looking forward to his crucifixion. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Judgment, putting things right. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. Prince of this world is the phrase describing Satan. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Satan's ultimate power was going to be restricted because of the victory of Jesus on the cross. And when we live for Jesus in the authority and power of Jesus, we are part of that battle against Satan. We continue it on in his name and in his authority. The followers of Jesus, including ourselves today, we have been given new authority and new power in the name of Jesus. Not because we're clever, not because we're good, not because we're worthy, but because of Jesus. We stand as his representatives in the world today. And we stand with Jesus in continuing the battle against Satan's power. His ultimate power has been broken, <clears throat> but he's thrashing around, causing problems. And one of his ways of working today is working through powerful proxies, spiritual and human. The spiritual ones, the evil angels called demons, they will infiltrate our societies and they undermine the status and work of Jesus. They can't stop it, they can't reverse it, but they undermine it. And they infiltrate us. They infiltrate our human organizations and systems. And they're trying to create deception and delusion and indeed confusion. Now you can see this today in the drive of Western political correctness, which contradicts the evidence. You can see it in the view that's widely held that all religions are equal and irrelevant. They're just human inventions. 
That's the kind of patronising way the religions are looked at in Western cultures today. You can, we can see it in the attempted destruction, and that's not too strong a world, of the followers of Jesus in dictatorial regimes in the world today. It's happening. Happening today, tragically. We can see it in Islamic claims. It claims to hold the answers, but it openly denies the status and work of Jesus. And John had very clear things to say about that. This is the kind of way that Satan is working. He can't reverse the work of Jesus on the cross, but he can hinder its impact on the world and make the lives of ordinary people miserable. We're living in an overall period between the resurrection of Jesus and his return. There's a spirit of rebellion against God that's abroad. John describes that in terms of antichrists, plural. This work undermines the true power of Jesus, seeks to undermine the true identity of Jesus, who he really was and is, undermines the achievement of Jesus on the cross and resurrection, and all the time is creating deception, delusion and confusion in the minds of people. That's the kind of tactics that Satan's using, and John pictures these, and we'll see how Revelation fits in with that picture and gives a picture that's consistent with it, although the language used may be slightly different. Now, John's letters don't relate specifically to the return of Jesus. The fact that there's this violent resistance, and it comes and it goes. You can't predict that Jesus is about to return when it grows a bit. That contradicts the teaching of Jesus. This is going to happen because Satan is thrashing around, working through proxies to disturb, to upset, to minimize the impact of Jesus for the benefit of humankind. Now, with that background in mind, which is very relevant to the book of Revelation, let's now turn to the book of Revelation in a general sense. <clears throat> it's a book that is puzzled. As a result, it's been a happy ground for people who want to generate bizarre views. Let's try and avoid that. We're looking at evidence. We're looking at the actual text. We're looking at what John says. We're looking at how it would have been understood by his original hearers. That gives us the key in the context of their life because it was written for them originally. Yes, it's full of strange images and events, quite bizarre at times. But that's because it's in a form of literature that we rarely ever see today. But it existed at this time. Apocalyptic literature is just a literature form which was seen at that time in quite a number of documents and John uses that style of literature in this book. But it was written to specific groups of people. I've coloured in in yellow roughly the area where this letter was addressed. The southwestern corner of what today we know as Turkey. There were groups of followers of Jesus scattered throughout that area, all part of the Roman Empire, and this was written for these groups originally. And we've got to interpret it in terms of the context of how they would have got it. The book describes itself as prophecy, but the format is of a letter. At the start, it describes itself as apocalypse. Now, in our Bibles, that word is translated revelation, from which we get the name of the book. But in the original language, it's apocalypse, which is a, a tr transliteration, exactly, of the original word in the Greek. So it's that style of literature, and John is making it clear. A prophecy speaking out the mind of God for a specific situation. It's not celestial timekeeping. It's addressed to people and showing what God thinks of the situation. You're looking under the spiritual radar as to what's happening. And it's a specific audience 
in a specific context and they would understand it in a specific way. But it also follows the normal letter format as the top of the letter shows. So it was sent and it would have been copied and then read to various groups of people. Most people at that time would not be able to read or write. So it's sent around groups of people in that part of the world to be read out to them. Now, apocalyptic literature, let's look at the characteristics of this. It's a carefully worked out system. It's not just crazy, not mad, it's not speculative, it's carefully worked out. Much comes through dreams and visions, that's very common in apocalyptic literature. The language is often cryptic and symbolic. That's the characteristic of that type of literature. We mustn't take numbers with exact meaning. They were symbolic. And usually such books were anonymous. This one's unusual because we can identify the author. Now that's the pattern of the literature. Now intense persecution had started. The violence was going to increase and the followers used to be hounded and killed mercilessly throughout the Roman Empire. This is in the last decade of the first century. And in that context, John is writing to equip the followers of Jesus just to survive. He's setting their sufferings in a spiritual context. There was great persecution in the 60s. It was now re-erupting on an even bigger scale as a particularly vicious emperor was assuming power. But John is trying to reassure his readers, his hearers, of the ultimate victory and that God is still in control. Now clearly there are parallels with what's happening in parts of the world today. Indeed, there are parallels with what's happened throughout history <clears throat> in parts of the world, where the followers of Jesus have been hounded mercilessly, have suffered terribly, and at times have kind of wonder what's this all about will I survive will my family survive so the book has got a direct relevance in that context but the message of the book is essentially subversive <coughs> the book basically predicts that the Roman Empire was not going to win God's kingdom was going to win Jesus is Lord he was sovereign if this book this letter was found in the hands of anybody, straight away the Roman authorities would have executed them, probably under torture. That's why the apocalyptics was probably used. Because when non-followers of Jesus, the Roman authorities, came across this, they would make no sense to them, because it uses symbolisms. But the symbolisms are meaningful to the hearers. Because the symbolisms draw from biblical symbolisms of the Old Testament and Christian ideas. So it would be unintelligible to the Roman persecutors, but it would make sense to the original hearers. For us today, it reveals key underlying spiritual principles that are of enormous importance. Now if we look at the book this way, it starts to make an awful lot of sense. It also prevents us going off into quite bizarre things where we generate all sorts of theological ideas with little substance. We're forgetting this is a book written in apocalyptic language. It's a type of writing. It's subversive. It uses symbolisms. It uses models and ideas that wouldn't be intelligible to those that opposed the work of Jesus, but would make sense to the followers of Jesus. Let's look at these two ideas a little bit further. This is a very quick summary 
but maybe because it's quick we can remember it. The apocalyptic literature spoke of the future that was breaking into the present. That's the style of literature. The prophetic literature foretold the future that would arise out of the present. So in other words, if you've got people who bitterly and brutally persecute the followers of Jesus, there are consequences for their actions. Inevitable consequences. Prophecy throws light on that. Apocalyptic literature shows how the future is breaking in and making sense of the present. So we've got the two things that come together to build us a magnificent picture. You could look at it that way. This is explaining why God's people suffer and why his intervention is delayed. And for people who were facing torture and death, that was incredibly important. But that side explains how we should live in this specific situation. Shows us under the radar what God thinks of it all and what God wants to do through it and what God can do for us in it. God can turn to advantage the most terrible situations for our benefit. This gives an insight into the meaning of that. So at the end of the book, It writes, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this scroll. Of course, it's written on a scroll. Because the time is near. <clears throat> the onslaught of the increased persecution was just starting. That's what John is referring to. It's not the end times. It's not some sort of indication that Jesus is about to come. We're reading Western ideas back into that. What John was saying is, Pass this word around. Be prepared. It's about to hit you. And it's going to be brutal. Be strong. Because Jesus is the victor. Now that's the thrust. The general drive of this book of Revelation. It pictures a holy war. The followers of Jesus and the Roman authorities were on a collision course. A collision course generated by the Roman authorities. The followers of Jesus would not accept that the Roman emperor was a god. And the Roman emperors in varying degrees claimed to be a god. And about this time one came to the, to the rulership who really pushed it. He was a god. And probably he was extremely mentally unstable. A collision course was inevitable. There's going to be an onslaught of persecution. It's what John is preparing his hearers for. And the seven letters at the beginning of Revelation were designed and written to prepare the churches for what faced them. There's little communities of followers of Jesus meeting in each other's homes in various areas. What was going to lie ahead for them? So they were prepared. Because it was that. That is happening in some parts of the world today. To be found to be a Christian in certain countries means certain death. In other countries, locked up in a labour camp from which few ever survive starve to death and work to death. In others, finding their villages bombed out, women and children brutalised. That's happening in our world today. It's the same as it was then. That's the only answer. It was the answer that Jesus demonstrated on the cross. It's our answer today. We don't retaliate. Suffering love. 
and suffering love always wins. God will put things right in the end, whatever we go through. He will see us through, <clears throat> he'll stand with us, and there's a glorious future with him, with Jesus forever. Words like justice and judgment are used. The significance of these words in the original language it often carries the meaning of God coming to put things right. Because things are very not right in the world, the world of John, and indeed parts of the world today. There is a heavenly reward. Jesus will see us through and put things right, no matter what life throws at us. And reassuring these suffering people that Jesus is the ultimate victor. Not the persecution, not the power of a, a Roman state, not the power of a dictatorial regime today, not the power of a religious system today. Jesus will win through. That word is used 17 times in the book. And the people to whom it was addressed, that word would be very important to them. You see, that's how they saw it at the human level. What John is doing is, is taking us below the human level to show that God's still in control <clears throat> and in the end of the day the Roman Empire would vanish. That's subversive. But history shows it's true. <clears throat> but the kingdom of God went on and the growth and the followers of Jesus kept going on and it's still going on today, although ignored by our media. There are great messages for us today <clears throat> in our troubled world. You could summarize a bit of the story earlier on. There's a story of a heavily pregnant woman and Satan is hovering to destroy the child. Look at the beginning of the life of Jesus. Born from God's people. Satan tried to have him killed in infancy through the work of Herod. <clears throat> Satan failed. The birth comes, a son. <clears throat> that picture there is the picture of Jesus in Old Testament language who comes to put things right. <clears throat> and through his life, death and resurrection, specifically his cross, Jesus came, came to put things right, to deal with humanity's rebellion against God and to break the power of Satan. At the end, that's what happened. But a kind of war breaks out against the followers of Jesus. Satan's wings have been clipped. He's been defeated on the cross. And this is the where we're living today. We're still living today. Satan's had his power reduced. He's been brought down by Jesus. But he's thrashing around, working through his proxies the demons, to try and undermine the work of Jesus in the world today. So Satan generates a beast out of the sea. This assumes great power and demands to be worshipped. That's the Roman Empire. <clears throat> and the hearers would have got that right away. But the Roman authorities wouldn't understand it. God's people do suffer. Imprisonment and death is part of it. But they're called to patient endurance and faithfulness. Suffering love is the way of Jesus. There's going to be systematic persecution and history shows there was. Satan generates a beast from the land. The beast forces everyone to worship the first beast. That's the Roman Empire. And the beast controls the freedom to trade and to live. The Roman religions combine forces with the Roman state to enforce the worship of the Caesar. And persecution was rife. Many died, but they're lifted high in God's presence. A message that people needed to hear when we think of life being all that we've got. There is a glorious destiny <clears throat> for those who remain faithful to Jesus. The good news of Jesus spreads, but the entire Roman Empire collapses. 
God intervenes and puts things right, bringing justice and judgment. That's subversive. But it happens to be historically what happened. And we can see today that the great empires and individual leaders of some of these people in the world today who are bitterly opposing the way of Jesus and making the followers of Jesus suffer, wreaking wars and havoc all around the world. <clears throat> Their destiny is destruction. They will not survive. But the followers of Jesus, if we hang on no matter what life throws at us, there is a glorious destiny. We can see how this would ring true and have meaning for the original hearers. You see, in this, John lifts the lid. He lifts the lid on what lies behind this period of intense persecution. It was horrendous. But John, in the apocalyptic language, is revealing Satan's tactics. He works through the deification of secular power, in this case the Roman Empire. But you can look out in some of the political systems in the world today and you can see how they are forcing people to conform and to worship them and do everything according to the way they want it. But corrupted religion and false spiritual leadership were all across the Roman Empire. The two fed off each other. Little facsimiles of the Roman Emperor were placed in all the temples of all the religions across the empire. And everybody was forced to go in, take a pinch of incense and burn it over the little facsimile to worship the emperor. The followers of Jesus found this very uncomfortable and refused to do it. When you did it, you got some kind of certificate to say you'd done it. If you didn't do it, you were open to being thrown into prison, torture, and death because you were seen as seditious. This is Satan's tactics to destroy the people of God. And what John is saying, hang on, hang on, no matter what's thrown at you, hang on. And he shows what's going to happen to God's faithful people. But he also shows what's going to happen to the system. A message of encouragement to people who were suffering. You see, it's not end times specifically. It's to do with how to survive intense persecution. John takes us behind the scenes, under the spiritual radar. And an apocalyptic language that they would understand, but the Roman authorities wouldn't, he shows what's happening in the spiritual realm. Satan's tactics, but God's end goal. That's the driving thrust of the book of Revelation and its purpose. Chapter 19, Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider and the horse and his army. But the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who had performed the signs on his, its behalf. With these signs he deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulphur. Remember, this is apocalyptic language. It uses symbolisms that would be intelligible to the followers of Jesus, but make no sense to the Roman authorities. That's the Roman Empire. That's the phrase he uses throughout. And for those suffering, it certainly was a beast. The force of violence. Rome ruled by imposing its will by violence. It brought peace, provided you did things its way. And if you didn't, you paid the terrible penalty, often the ultimate penalty. It used violence to enforce its will. That's true in most dictatorial regimes that are operating in the world today. Jesus is the rider on the horse. 
the Roman Empire using violence. It's using that violence against the people of God, the followers of Jesus. But Jesus is still in control. And we are his army. He has delegated us the power to enable us to cope, to enable us to win the battles and to get through. And there's our corrupted religion. The religion got the backhanders from the political masters. Provided they were conformed to what Rome wanted, they could have their power. They used it. And indeed records show there were miracles. The miracles were not counterfeit. The origin was counterfeit because it comes from Satan and his demons. Now you can see that in the world today where religions get control of or link up with the political organisation. And when they do that it's the worst. Religion and politics when they combine wreak destruction on the followers of Jesus. And that's happening in many parts of the world today. And there's the worshipping the images of Caesar. And you've got some kind of certificate or mark to say when you've done it. You were an acceptable member of the Roman Empire. But if you didn't have that mark or couldn't produce a certificate, you could be hounded to your death. Because it was being used as a loyalty to the state. But the emperor was claiming divinity. And that's what was going to happen to Rome and its pernicious religious systems. And history shows that's what happens. Now this is imagery taken from volcanoes. And there were volcanoes in the middle, in that part of the world. So they use that imagery. John uses it. The most violent and destructive thing he would know. The destruction of Rome and its pernicious religious systems. They've all gone. But the kingdom of God went on and kept on growing. And it always will. The messages for the earliest hearers would be the Roman Empire, Emperor will be supported by corrupted religion. That was what was happening. Tragically, it still happens today when in the name of religion the followers of Jesus are being persecuted hounded, tortured and killed. And it's happening on a huge scale as all independent news organisations are reporting. But in the West our media ignore it. Because they've been infiltrated by the work of Satan. Emperor worship was going to be imposed and under the Emperor in that last decade it certainly was. And if you didn't conform, you paid a terrible penalty. Torture or death. It's bad enough for anyone to go through that, but to watch a loved one being put through it in front of you to try and break you and make you cooperate, that is a thousand times worse. And John is saying to his hearers, Hang on! Remain faithful, no matter what happens. And he's lifting the lid spiritually to show what is going to happen and what the ultimate destiny will be for them if they hung on, even if they were tortured and killed. Jesus will see them right. It's a message for all time. It's nothing specifically to do with the return of Jesus. But it's going to happen all the time until Jesus returns finally. Today religion and politics combine to create false worship. 
Sometimes the political leaders take one religious group, curry their favour, to control the people. Sometimes the religious leaders take control of the political system and enforce their way. These are happening in the world today. Either way, any follower of Jesus is up against it. Because if you won't conform, you're persecuted. Sometimes brutally, but sometimes subtly. Your business is boycotted till you go bankrupt. Your children are denied education. You can't get a job, and if you do, you can never get promotion. The jobs open to you are the jobs at the bottom of the social heap. That's the message that John has for us today. It's subtle in the West, but it's violent and brutal in many other parts of the world. Here's a few of the isms. Communism did this and is still doing it in China and North Korea. Fascism did this, and you can still see elements of that in some South American states. Humanism is growing in the West, and its persecution is subtle. <coughs> Islamism, now I'm not talking about Islam, I'm talking about Islamism. That's doing it in many Islamic states. Hinduism is taking control of the political leadership in India, making the life of the followers of Jesus misery. They're probably scared to take on the Muslims at the moment, because retaliation will happen. But the followers of Jesus are a soft touch because they don't retaliate, suffering love. And Buddhism is combining with the army state in Myanmar today to wipe out those of other religions and the Christians are getting it worse than any other group although our media don't admit it. United Nations reports show that's the case. There are some of the isms of today that are doing exactly the same as what was happening under the Roman Empire in the days of John. Revelation 13 speaks of two beasts. Secular power that claims absolute authority. It's only one step from there to claim divinity. There are places in the world today where secular power claims absolute authority. And there are now quite a few <coughs> where well, that's verging into more or less divinity. Particularly North Korea and China's going the same way. Corrupted religion of all sorts and shapes. False spiritual leadership that collaborates with the political masters or influences and controls the political masters. That's the two beasts of Revelation 13 as John makes very clear. And overall, that's what they do. Now you can see it in the subtlety of political correctness today, where things are being forced through legislatures. Things that are anti-God, anti-Jesus, and indeed will damage human lives. But we're being forced to conform, and to do things, and to say things, which contradict the ways of Jesus. We're facing that in the West and it's going to get worse. It links in with what John was talking about, the Antichrists. All of these systems undermine who Jesus is, stand against his way. It fits in with the man of lawlessness that Paul pictures in 2nd Second, Second Thessalonians. Someone without law, they make up the rules to suit themselves, contradicting the way of life that brings benefit to human beings. 
We see it in the isms that I pictured in the last frame. But what's their destiny? Let's remember that. And let's remember it's a picture. It's a picture of total destruction. John was showing to his hearers in language that only they would understand that the destiny of all that evil that was burnt, building up in the Roman Empire was total destruction. History shows it's true. Within a few centuries, the Roman Empire had ceased to exist. But what about the followers of Jesus? If we follow John's instructions, hang on, hang on, no matter what it's thrown at us, hang on, be faithful. That's the message of Revelation. Do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. Oh, it's easy to say. But do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. When we suffer, and indeed die for Jesus, Jesus does not shortchange us. We're given the crown of life. We're honoured in his presence. That's the picture that John brings us in this apocalyptic language. What a glorious and wonderful message. Not directly related to end times, but it warns us. <clears throat> the fact that persecution comes and grows, things fall apart, that's not signs of the times. There are no signs of the times. It's just Satan thrashing around, <clears throat> working through his proxy, proxies, people and systems, to try to undermine the work of Jesus. Hang on. Do not be afraid. The destiny is glorious. And that's what Jesus said. <clears throat> to his followers before his death, he, I have told you these things, so that in me you may have peace. Oh, how much we want peace. In this world you'll have trouble. Peace. He gives us. The world gives us trouble. Then he says, but take heart, I've overcome the world. And on the cross, he brought down the power of the evil one. He defeated the power of human rebellion. And he gives us peace when we come to him. No matter what life may throw at us. <clears throat> and what was going to be thrown at these people that John was writing to would be horrendous. I've overcome the world. Hang on. Hang on. Even to the point of death. And I will give you the crown of life. What a magnificent message. It fits in with what we've seen in John and Paul. The power of the state, organized religion, they combine to generate brutal persecution of the followers of Jesus. They always have and are still doing it today. That's the picture that John that is painting for us here in apocalyptic language. We are called to be faithful, to hang on and to see the end goal is something glorious. That Jesus is King. He is Lord. And there's a wonderful future with Him. Don't see these as signs of the times. That's the wrong way to look at it. This violent resistance will simply occur till Jesus returns. It is just simply Satan thrashing around. He's defeated. He's thrashing around, working through proxies. To undermine the work of Jesus. To keep people away from him. And it's just going to happen. But we are called. Hang on. Be faithful. Now in the next presentation we're going to look at more of what John has shown us in Revelation. 
particularly millennialism. 